Um, so good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us on your Saturday evening. Um, uh, my name's Julia. I am a lecturer at Hiroshima Bunkyo University, and today I want to just talk about the role of different types of memory in the learning process. Um, today's presentation, it's, it's designed for people who are not familiar with this. Um, it's, I'm going to kind of break everything down and explain it. Um, and then we will focus on teaching implications at the end. So bear with me through introductions to some of these theories, and then we'll talk about what it means for the classroom. So um, before we get started, uh, today I am the second um, talk in a series. On March 11th, we already had a lovely presentation by David and Curtis about the C factor. And coming up next on May 14th, we have Amanda, who is here. Uh, Hi, Amanda. She's going to be talking about music um, in the brain and how it can aid language learning, which I'm sure will be excellent. Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, of course it's going to be good. And then on Friday, June 3rd, we have Stephen M. Ryan, and he's going to be talking about stories in the brain and in the classroom. And he's also an excellent presenter. So uh, do keep an eye out for these and make sure you RSVP for them as well. Um, as we are a series. And we're all from the Mind, Brain, and Education SIG here at JALT. So here is the goal of everything I want to talk about um, for today's presentation. First, I'm going to go over um, and review memory and the three main types of memory. And after that, I will introduce something that is called cognitive load theory, which is the primary theory of learning. And finally, we'll go into teaching implications. And my goal is to have at least 10 to 15 minutes left over for questions at the end. Um, so if you do have questions, just kind of hang on to them. There will be time at the end. I'm, I'm going to work real hard to, to get us that. So if that sounds good, let's get started. So we're going to talk about the types of memory. And there are three main types of memory, according to um, most theories of psychology. Uh, first, you have sensory memory, which I'll go into in detail. Just there's sensory memory. There is working memory, which is also known as short term memory. It might be a term you're more familiar with. And then we have long term memory, which is another term many of you have probably heard uh, and is divided into two subtypes, explicit and implicit. Okay. So let's start with sensory memory, because this is kind of the, the, the first level of memory, if you will. Um, sensory memory, it's all of the input from our five senses. So sound, sight, taste, touch, smell. All of this information is constantly coming into your brain, but we're only conscious of a really small fraction of this input. Um, is if we were conscious of everything, it would overwhelm us. We, we would just not be able to think or, or process anything. Um, how much that percentage is, how much of this are we actually conscious of is, is uncertain, unclear. Um, but typically sensory memory lasts about one to three seconds. Um, and then it kind of disappears. So right now your body is aware of the feeling of your butt in your chair of the temperature in the room, um, maybe the smell of the lamb curry that's getting cooked, um, <laughs> you know, the sound of my voice, the sight of my screen, all of this input is coming into your sensory memory. Um, but you're only conscious of whatever you put your attention on. And as soon as your attention goes away, you stop noticing um, this input. So it's kind of there until it gets <coughs> your attention, you don't notice it. So that leads us to the next main point of work of memory, which is working memory, which I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about because this is kind of the, the, the important one for cognition. Working memory is often shortened to WM as an acronym. And in some theories of some psychologists, researchers uh, consider it interchangeable with short-term memory, that they are the same 
kind of concept. Um, other researchers believe working memory and short-term memory are actually distinct and different. Um, so if you are in that latter camp, I am sorry for offending you, but I'm going to consider them one and the same. Working memory equals short-term memory. Um, and what this memory, the kind of a loose definition, is that this is the part of our minds dedicated to the conscious, real-time manipulation of information. Um, which if that sounds complicated, it's not. It's the memory that you're using right now to think. You're, you're, you're listening to what I'm saying and you're thinking about it. That voice in your head, that's your working memory in action. Um, so this is what you're using in real time to think. Um, so working memory, a couple key points about it is that the capacity of our working memories is finite. Uh, storage lasts about 15 to 30 seconds without any kind of rehearsal. So if you have a thought and it's in your working memory and you don't touch it, it's gonna leave your working memory in about 15 seconds, 30 seconds. It comes in, it comes out, unless you hang on to it. Um, and capacity, our working memory capacity can't be increased probably um, there is research into this looking into how do we improve or, or make people's working memories bigger so you can hold more running thoughts in your head at the same time um, but the research on this has been pretty controversial and it's mixed partly because we can't really point you know put an mri on the brain and look at a specific point and be like yeah that that little area here is the working memory um, this is more of a, theolo a theoretical construct. We don't really know where this matches physically into the brain quite yet. This is more of a, a working theory. Um, so measuring it in research can be a little bit tricky. We're never quite sure if we're actually measuring someone's working memory or uh, something else. Um, so that's why we're not sure if capacity can be increased or not. But it can, you can learn how to become more efficient with your working memory. And you can do strategy instruction to teach people how to be more efficient in using their working memory so that, you know, they can manage your ongoing thoughts better. Um, some techniques you can use are subvocal rehearsal. So let's say you're trying to remember a phone number, right? Someone has told you a phone number, you don't quite have anywhere to write it down, so you're trying to remember it. You might start repeating it over and over in your head, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is subvocal rehearsal. You're not saying it out loud, you're kind of just articulating it over and over in your thoughts. It's, it's a way to keep it there. Another thing you might do is called chunking. Again, with a phone number, you might go, one, two, three as a chunk, four, five, six as a chunk, and seven, eight, nine as a chunk. So you only have three things to remember instead of nine distinct numbers. Um, that's another way to be a little more efficient. And mnemonic devices, um, that's any rhyme or, or, or pattern you use to help you remember something. Like in math, you might have learned PEMDAS as please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Um, something to help you remember your order of operations. Um, those are called, that's a mnemonic device. Um, that's what that is. So basically, working memory is your real-time thinking. You can't think about too many things at the same time, and you can't think about stuff for very long um, unless you put effort into it using these strategies. If you don't hang on to a thought consciously, it is going to poof, it's going to leave your working memory. And that leads us to our last type of memory, which is long-term memory, um, which is a little bit of a misnomer. Yes, long-term memory means the memories that are stored over a long period of time. But what long means is actually about two minutes. You start forming long-term memories within two minutes. Uh, so if working memory lasts 15 to 30 seconds, 
and long-term memory forms at two minutes, you don't have to hang on to something too long before you can actually draw on it again from your long-term memory. Um, so it takes about two minutes to form it, and it should last you a lifetime, probably. Long-term memory is divided into two broad categories. Um, explicit memories, which are things you can remember with a conscious effort. So remembering when the United States joined, you know, became an independent country, remembering that date is an explicit memory. You, you have to think about it a little bit, but you can say it. You can, you know, remember that date. You can remember trivia, those kinds of things. Stories that happened to you in your life, memories that you've experienced, anything that you can really articulate and visualize in your head and talk about are explicit memories. The other category is implicit. And these are things that you can remember unconsciously and effortlessly. This is things like riding a bicycle. Um, once you've mastered it, of course, it's, you can do it automatically. Your body knows what to do. You don't have to think about where you're putting your legs and your feet. You just do it. Uh, your native language is another example of an implicit memory because you can just speak your native language. You don't have to really think too hard about it. And that's why it's hard for native speakers to explain grammatical rules of their native language because they don't, you know, they, there's no effort to produce. And so then you have to go back and think about why certain things in your native language are the way they are and articulate it. And that's actually quite hard because it's not an explicit memory, it's an implicit one. Um, so as language teachers, our goal is for students to have form implicit memories of English or whatever language we're teaching them, right? We want them to effortlessly speak their, their target language. Um, so we'll talk about how do we can get there. Um, it'll, it'll get them, it'll, it'll come up. Um, but two more points for long-term memory. Theoretically, memories are permanent in our long-term memory. Once they're in there, they're in there forever theoretically. The connections to them might weaken over time or get lost, but it, it doesn't mean the memory is lost, just that the connections are. But I won't go into that too much. It's a, a different, um, whole different presentation. Uh, capacity in our long-term memory is also theoretically unlimited. There's no limit to how many things you can remember over the course of your lifetime. It's, it's all in there somewhere. So, I want to do a quick memory demonstration. It'll kind of take us through all three types. There is a gorgeous symbol here on the right side of your screen. I want you to look at it with your eyes, get that nice sensory input, you know, coming in. Um, and in the chat, I would like you to write what you think this symbol is called. So draw on your long-term memory, you know, think about it in your working memory. What, what is this called? What do you call this symbol? So an asterisk, okay. Um, sharp, oh, musician, sharp. All right, another musician. A hashtag, someone really likes Twitter, sharp, hashtag. Okay, a grid, yeah, it, it looks like a grid. Yeah, that works. Um, drunken intersection, yeah, I wouldn't wanna drive through that. A number, yes, that's also known as the number sign. Phone number, yes hashtag or number, sharp, a lot of musicians. Oh, Igeta in Japanese. Oh, that's new. Thank you, Aki. Hash sharp number. Okay. Tic-tac-toe. Yes. All right. So all of you actually have quite a few different, you, you've got the input, you're thinking about it, and you've actually got already quite a few connections and memories, you know, associated with this symbol. Um, I preemptively imagined a few popular answers. I did not think of sharp because I am not a musician, so uh, I will add that back in in a future presentation. But, you know, a lot of people look at this and they'll think hashtag, number, or number sign, or a pound, pound sign. Um, if you, you know, used to use old, you know, rotary dial-up phones, right? Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you something new because no one has said the correct answer of what this is actually called. So I'm going to teach you something new 
And we'll come back to this to see how well this memory, this new memory forms. So this is actually officially called an octothorpe. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but we'll say octothorpe. Uh, it comes from octo and thorpe. Um, octo we know means eight, if you're familiar with, with your um, root words. And thorpe is actually of unknown origin. Um, a lot of linguists have studied this. They're not sure where the thorpe comes from. It's just there. Um, but it means from the eight points of the circumference, there's so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight points on this symbol. So that's where octothorpe comes from. And this is according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, which I think is a reputable source. Uh, so I want you to hang on to this. This is an octothorpe. And I don't want you to forget. So just think about it. It's octothorpe. I want you to do some subvocal rehearsal, you know, repeat it in your mind. Um, you know, maybe count it a few times, but just octothorpe. Everyone good? And we're gonna move on. Maybe. Aha. I lost a slide. No? Oh, okay, here we go. So now that we have this kind of basic understanding of memory, you know, input comes in, we think about it, and if we hold on to it long enough, it goes to our long-term memory. But cognitive load theory kind of complicates this a little bit. It says it's not a smooth 30 second, two minute journey. There, there's another step, some more parts we have to add in to actually equal learning. And it's in a nutshell, it's the theory that different ideas weigh on the mind differently. So this is the theory that learning requires mental effort, which I'm sure you've all experienced having been students in the past, having seen students, you know, you know, sweating and, and mentally, you know, working their, their, their mental muscles, if you will, trying to wrestle with some new idea or, or concept. Um, so this theory is solely focused on the connection from working memory to long-term memory. How do we hang on to something longer than the 30 seconds it would naturally last in our working memory until at least two minutes where it, you know, forms in our long-term memory and we start learning it, right? How do we get there? That's what this theory focuses on. Um, in short, different ideas weigh differently in our working memory and require more or less effort to think about. And learning happens when we can balance the weights of these ideas in the limited capacity of our working memory. So let me give you an analogy to kind of help you visualize things. This is my favorite. So we've got a nice donkey cart here. And that's a donkey, not a horse. It's a donkey. Um, this cart represents our working memory capacity. We all have this cart in our head. And each of our carts is a different size. Some of us have big carts. Some of us have small carts. And we can't really do too much to change it. And even if you're born with a big cart, if you're having a bad day, if you're really stressed out, the stress will actually reduce your, temporarily reduce your working memory capacity. So maybe you've got a really bad Monday. And on Monday, your working memory cart is a little smaller than normal. Can't hold as much. Uh, the donkey is cognition yourself. It, it, it's pulling the cart. It's, it's pulling the cart. It's pulling our working memory and everything in it towards our long-term memory. And it's going to kind of go back and forth. You know, it's, it's pull stuff into the working memory um, from working, sorry, from working memory to long-term memory. We learn it. And then it goes back to, you know, put something new and carry it forward, you know, into our working, our long-term memory. Blah. Um, and our goal is reaching the long-term memory and forming memories because that means we're learning it, theoretically. So just keep this donkey cart in our head. We've got donkey carts. Carts are different sizes. A donkey's got to pull it. And if it starts getting heavy, it's got to work harder to do so. So cognitive load theory posits that there are three ideas have three different things weighing them down. First, there is something called intrinsic load. 
And this is the difficulty level of an idea at the time of encountering it. If you're a novice, this idea, this intrinsic load is going to be really heavy. It's going to take up more of your working memory cart. If you're an expert, it's going to be light. It's not going to weigh very much, you know, because you've experienced it many times before. It's a very small load for you. It doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, theoretically, repeat encounters with a new concept, with an idea, with, with just a fact or whatever, the more you encounter it, the smaller the intrinsic load will become over time um, as familiarity builds. So we can't do anything about intrinsic load as teachers. This is inherent to each student. Um, at the time you teach a new concept, their intrinsic load is fixed. And, and you have no idea what it is. It might be real big. It might be the first time a student has ever experienced what you're trying to teach. Or they might have already learned it over many, many years and they're experts and it's review for them. Um, but it's going to be different for each kid. And you can't really control this. Um, this is based on their life experience. So just um, let's use math teaching as an example. I actually studied how to be a math teacher at the same time I studied to be an English teacher. So I, I like math and math is really good at, at building up expertise over time. You, you start, let's say, learning addition, right? We start learning addition at a pretty young age with this, you know, one plus two equals three. It's kind of the foundation, the, the first concept in math you really learn after you learn numbers, right? Um, so the first time you teach one plus two equals three to your toddler or whatever age you're starting with, your, your very young child, the intrinsic load is going to be quite huge as it's their very first time to experience this, this, this idea of addition, right? Um, and if it's too big of a concept, look, if I, if I just tried throwing mm, long division at this five-year-old, you know, or, or square roots or things, the intrinsic load is going to be so big that they just the cart can't move. There's no possible way for them to learn it. It's just too heavy. Um, however, when we start teaching addition to students, we don't just teach it to them once. We teach it to them many times. We might teach them how to count on their fingers first, you know, one finger, two fingers. Oh, now you have three fingers, right? Or we give them, you know, toys, blocks or something so they can physically move things around. Um, we, we keep coming at it from a few different angles and eventually they master it. That intrinsic load becomes so light that they can do the math without, you know, this basic addition without too much trouble. And then you start building up to different skills. Um, language teaching as well is actually quite good at scaffolding things we start with the basics basic vocabulary and then we slowly build up um, there's a lot of parallels but anyway this is just to demonstrate how intrinsic load can change with repeat instruction the next type of load in cognitive load theory is called extraneous load and this has to do with the environment in which an idea is presented to the learner if it's, um, ooh, pardon my typo, if it's a noisy and distracting environment, you're going to have heavy weight. Your extraneous load is going to be quite heavy if you've got a really distracting, you know, lots of stuff going on. Um, if you've got a quiet and relaxing atmosphere, you know, it's easy to focus, your extraneous load will be quite light, um, which is good. You don't want it to be very heavy. As teachers, we have some control over extraneous load. Um, we can make sure that our classroom, you know, that our students don't have side chatter when we're explaining something, you know, that they're paying attention, uh, that they're not blasting music from their phones or, you know, doing anything that, that would interfere with the transmission of these new ideas. Um, but sometimes it can be out of our control. For example, last year there was a lot of construction happening right next door to my classroom, jackhammers going off at all hours of the day very hard for me to even think about what I'm doing as a teacher, let alone for my students to listen to me and try to learn. Um, and I couldn't go out and yell at the construction workers to like shut up because I'm trying to teach. They had their job to do and I just had to deal with it, right? So sometimes we can control extraneous load as teachers, sometimes we can't, um, just as much as you can. 
try to keep your classrooms conducive for learning. The final load is the most ad recent addition to cognitive load theory, um, and it's a little less as well explained compared with the other two. Um, but this is known as germane load, and it has to do with how an idea is presented to the learner. So of all of the loads, this is the one that teachers have complete control over. Um, this is, has to do with your teaching methodology is this load. If you're explaining a concept with many high level words that students, for instance, haven't fully mastered yet, that germane load is going to be really heavy because they just it's hard for them to reach and find how salient the new idea is. Um, if you're explaining a concept with diagrams like my donkey cart here, simpler words, your germane load is going to be lighter. Um, which is what you want. You want a light germane load because, again, if things get too heavy on this cart, we run into problems with learning, which I'll go into soon. Um, so with germane load, a teacher needs to make new ideas more salient to the learner. And as much as you can, you want to help them draw connections to their existing long term memories. You know, you want to connect new ideas to old as much as you can. Um, connect topics, you know, connect new things to topics students are already familiar with. Um, so that helps the new things be a bit more salient. It helps them, you know, draw on their long term memories. So they're not just existing in their working memory. But what happens when the cart gets the loads are too heavy? <laughs> you get with this poor donkey here um, is experienced cognitive overload. Um, so this is when the mental load is too heavy, uh, something went wrong, the intrinsic load, the extraneous load, the germane load, all combined was too much for the cart, for our working memory, and so we experience cognitive overload. And when that happens, everything that was in your donkey cart, everything in your working memory goes poof, it's gone, just poof. Um, and everything that went poof, if you hadn't already learned it, if it wasn't already in your long term memory, you're not getting it back. So if someone just told you a phone number and you hadn't remembered it, you know, for two minutes yet, it's gone. And if you didn't write it down on a paper in front of you, you're not getting that phone number back, you know. Um, so cognitive overload can be interrupting. It interrupts the learning process. Um, it's a normal part of cognition. I mean, we, we're, you know, as humans, we have this limited donkey cart to work with. That's normal. That's just how our brains are. We experience cognitive overload multiple times throughout the day. You're probably experiencing it at least once or twice, maybe more during this presentation. You just lose your train of thought. You can't quite remember what you were just doing. You're going to the fridge and you forget why, you know. That's cognitive overload. He says it's happened. Um, however, as teachers, we want to minimize cognitive overload as much as we can with our students because we want them to learn. And if all these new ideas they're trying to learn keep going poof, they're not going to learn. So with some planning, we can minimize the harms of cognitive overload. We can't stop it from happening, but we can help students recover the things they were trying to learn. So here are some common signs of what cognitive overload looks like in students during class. Students that are overloaded will suddenly stop whatever they were doing. You know, maybe you're having them do a discussion activity and then they just kind of start standing around being quiet because they don't remember what they're supposed to do. They, they, you know, poofed. Um, they might start engaging in off-topic chatter because they know they're supposed to talk. They can't remember what they're supposed to talk about, so they just start talking about whatever they want with their friends. Uh, you might start seeing kids zoning out and they stop paying attention. Um, I know I do that during a long lecture. I'll suddenly find myself looking out a window and I can't remember what they were just talking about, you know, because I've experienced cognitive overload. Um, if you ask them what they're supposed to be doing, they have incomplete recall they can no longer remember the directions. And you might find them repeating stuff they've already finished because they don't remember finishing it. So they do it again. Um, 
But these are common signs. And of course, if you go up to a kid and ask them what, why they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they don't have the meta language to say, I have experienced cognitive overload. Uh, that, that's not <laughs> what your students are going to tell you, unless you're like me and you teach them about cognitive overload, in which case they will. But most of the time, they just can't, they just tell you they forgot what they're supposed to be doing and you're disappointed in them. Why don't they remember? Well, now you know why they don't remember. Um, and for language classrooms in particular, here's some common tasks that teachers often ask students to do that are actually cognitively quite heavy are more prone to cause cognitive overload. Um, the biggest is listening to a lecture while trying to take notes, especially if that lecture is in their second language. The more unfamiliar vocabulary words they encounter, that they're trying to frantically write everything down and they have to choose what they're writing down. And, and that's just a lot of thoughts you're trying to juggle at the same time. Um, it's very easy to experience overload. Um, it doesn't take much to tip over a cart if, if everything's kind of heavy to begin with. Um, following complex directions. If you've got a lot of steps to, for students to remember to do, you increase your chances of them forgetting partway through. Um, when students have to decode unfamiliar words, either in the directions, lectures, materials, or other tasks, um, I believe the sweet spot is you want to end like reading. You only want about like 5% of the vocabulary to be new in the target reading. Otherwise, you really run into just comprehension issues also. But the comprehension issues come from all the cognitive overload. They just keep having to stop, translate. They lose the meaning. They don't remember what it is. They can go back, but then they might forget the word that they just translated. And it just keeps going, you know, just overload after overload. Um, and finally, writing sentences from memory or dictation is quite hard, especially if it's a long, complex sentence with unfamiliar words. They don't remember how to spell. They're trying to hold it all in and write it down and spell it. And it's just too many things going on at once. And they're very likely to experience overload. Um, but it doesn't mean that these are bad tasks or tasks you should avoid. You just should be aware that these are cognitively heavy tasks especially in a second or third language. So in summary, cognitive load theory says that we have limited working memory capacity. We've got these little donkey carts. Every student has a different sized cart and their cart sizes can fluctuate day to day. We've got three kinds of, uh, each idea has three different things in balance competing with each other. You've got the intrinsic load, the germane load, and the extraneous load. And the donkey, you know, us, we're, we're, our goal is to carry this idea for two minutes to our long-term memory. If we can get it there, we've theoretically learned it, although it might be a pretty weak memory at the beginning. We got to keep revisiting it, you know, multiple times to really strengthen it and start to master it. Um, but if things get too heavy, the donkey cannot complete the journey, loses everything in the cart, has to start over. So, <laughs> hope as a short and sweet summary. And I hope you are now ready to take a little break and kind of process everything you've just heard. Um, so you're going to go into a breakout room with just one person, so you have time to really talk these out. And I have two questions I want you to talk about. One. What can teachers do to reduce occurrences of cognitive overload during class? And second, how can we help students who have experienced cognitive overload? There's no wrong answers, just think about it. What can we do to reduce cognitive overload? And how can we help students who have every, you know, empty out their carts? So if Jackie or Chadu, if one of you would please do me the honors of putting everyone into breakout rooms with one partner, please. Yes, yes. I, you're in a room, Julia, so I'm moving oh, somebody around. Just, just a moment, sorry. Mm -hmm. and someone else is there. Sorry, sorry for the delay. Oh my God. Uh, Okay, all right. Um, and did you still want to go with about five minutes or so? Yeah, let's aim yeah. for about okay. five minutes. I think that'll okay. work. All right, all right. Good, good.
Uh, are you ready to start? Is everyone ready? So remember, what can teachers do to reduce cognitive overload and how can we help students experiencing it? Go. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> yeah, so the rooms should be open. Go ahead and join and enjoy your conversations. And if you have trouble, please let us know. Would you? <laughs> Thank you, Jackie or, or uh, Chadu, whoever restarted that uh, recording. Thank you. Um, so I hope everyone had a, a good five minutes of just kind of wrestling with these. And now I'm going to test your long term memory. I, I hope you're ready for it. Oh, space. Hang on. OK. Where, where to go? Ah, I lost it. Oh, it must be later. Sorry, I'll test you later. The test is coming. But first, um, I want to talk about teaching implications. That's my my long term memory got goofed. Here we go. Um, so we've talked about memory. I've talked about this theory of learning. And now I want to talk about um, what this means for us as teachers. What are some strategies we can bring into our classrooms? Um, I'm going to tell you now, most of what I'm going to tell you is good teaching practices in general. But this is why, neurologically, these are why these are good practices. So um, we'll start with, um, first, you want to focus on reducing extraneous load in your classroom as much as you can and encouraging germane load. Um, not you, that you want the germane load to be heavy, but, but you want to focus as much as you can on the germane load and making sure extraneous load is as non-existent as you can make it in your classroom. Um, so that means keep your classroom environment suitable for learning, you know, make sure that when you're speaking, students are listening, not talking with each other, you know, they don't, you don't want th com things competing for their attention and, and you know, building a heavier extraneous load. You also want to, as much as you can, connect new concepts to old with frequent reviews. Um, because that draws on long-term memory, that's good germane load, and that also reduces the intrinsic load over time because they, they increase mastery of these review concepts. And you also want to revisit concepts in multiple ways to also develop student expertise, shrink that intrinsic load down, you know, help them master. You know, we don't just teach students one plus two equals three in one way, we, we come into it in many different ways. And as language teachers, we should be doing that too. We don't just teach them past tense in one situation. We teach them past tense in multiple ways. We teach them how to recognize it in reading and speaking in different situations. And you know, that's what you wanna do. You don't wanna just teach them past tense once, assume they learn it and never come back to it, right? We, we rev keep revisiting it. You also want students, you want to help them draw on their long-term memory and reduce their reliance on working memory. Um, I talked about this a little bit in my breakout session, but as adult learners and as adults in general, we have a lot more long-term memory that we can draw upon. We don't have to use up as much of our working memory because we've already learned and been exposed to so much. The memories are already kind of there. But our students, especially younger students, don't have as many long-term memories yet, um, and they need help drawing these connections. So use what students already know to facilitate learning. For example, when you're choosing a, a reading topic, try to choose readings on familiar topics so that you can focus on the grammatical concepts. Um, in testing, that's one of the, the, the easiest ways to, to screw over a student is to have a reading passage about a, some concept a student has never been exposed to before. So a student's trying to understand the language, but they can't understand the context of playing golf or, or, or going to Barbados or, or something they've never experienced or, or don't have familiarity with. So try to choose reading topics that relate to students' daily life, their culture, you know, things they already know, so you can focus on the grammar unless the new stuff is what you want to focus on, in which case the grammar should be what they already know. Um, you also want to break down directions into manageable chunks. So break things down into simpler steps if you can. 
And you want to check for student understanding by having them repeat back your directions before they do the task. So I don't know if you noticed, but I repeated several times the questions I wanted you to talk about with your partners because I wanted to make sure that it came to you a few different times and has likely made its way you know, to your long-term memory, maybe a little bit better. Um, so I like having students tell me what they're supposed to do before they go and do it or tell a partner what they're supposed to do before they go and do it. And that's just to, to help repeat the directions a few times, hopefully get it to their long-term memory and they remember it. The other thing that's really great to do is when appropriate, provide tangible memory aids for students. Um, a memory aid is something like a checklist, um, a visual, you know, just aid, prompts, written directions. You know, if you're going to have students break off into a discussion and use screens, projector screens, have the directions written on the, the, the screen. So if the students, you know, experience overload in the middle of the task, they can look up at the screen, see what they need to do next, and they can continue going. They can recover that memory independently from themselves. Um, this is a language teacher especially, but you want to make sure that as language teachers, you're providing language input that is simple, structured, and redundant. Simple doesn't mean dumbed down, or, you know, our students are intelligent. We just need to make sure that we're including only the most necessary and relevant information, um, you know, the, the, so they can focus on the language. Um, structured input is easily accessible for learners. It focuses on a single target feature at a time, so that target becomes more salient. So if you're focusing on past tense, you just have past tense. You're not mixing in present progressive, past progressive, past perfect, you know, a bunch of other stuff. You're focusing on one grammar feature, one target feature at a time. And you want redundant input um, because it's more often in the working memory, and that increases the chances for long-term storage and stronger memory formation the more often you revisit something. So, you know, do past tense repeatedly, a lot over time, not just one sentence and done, right? We got to do it a lot. Um, last two points, and then I'm testing you. Um, we're going to, uh, you want to reduce language learning anxiety. So anxiety and stress actually use up our working memory capacity either in the form of extraneous load being heavier or the stress being so much that their cart temporarily, you know, has a smaller size. They just have less working memory capacity. Um, so there's some simple anxiety reduction techniques that you can use. So at least your classroom isn't creating more stress. Um, you want to create opportunities for student success. Students who believe they can succeed in your class are going to be less anxious. You want to reduce the perceived difficulty of language learning. You know, if you have kids thinking, ah, ego, I'm moody, you know, they just think learning English is impossible for them, they'll never do it. That's, that's stressing them out, right? You need to help them realize that it's possible. So you start with some simple, low level difficulty tasks that they can succeed at and build up their confidence. Um, and you also want to build a safe learning space where making mistakes is okay. Right, which I think as language teachers, we all try to do, you know, you don't put a kid on a spot because they make a mistake. You celebrate mistakes, you encourage them to keep trying um, because mistakes are how we learn, right? And finally, um, this one's a little bit harder to remember on the fly, but you want to adjust your use of corrective feedback. So recasts in particular are harder to notice when there's a lot going on in working memory. So that recast is when you repeat back what a student said with correct grammar. So if a student says, I is hungry, you recast by saying, I am hungry, right? You repeat back what a student says correctly. But if there's too many things going on, they're not going to notice that you just said something correct back at them. They just hear you say what they said, and they don't notice these subtle changes, possibly, unless you really emphasize and even then it, they might not notice it. Um, so when you do give corrective feedback, especially for speaking in the moment, you wanna keep it as short, simple and stressed and as explicit as possible to really draw the student's attention to it um, so that they know what the correction is, what the mistake was and 
it's not taking up too much space that they can redo it and succeed which is easier said than done theoretically this is what we should do as teachers in reality sometimes students are just not going to notice our feedback because we do it on the fly without thinking sometimes right okay that's my cat telling me to give you a test so open up the chat again what is this symbol called do you remember did that make it to your long-term memory oh look at that oh we've even got some spelling good good octothorpe octothorpe yes you did learn that well done octothorpe okay so that was successful long-term memory formation because i haven't talked about the octothorpe for a good 20 minutes the only way you could have remembered that is if it made it successfully from your working memory to your long-term memory so that's our goal um of course if i asked you this in a week you might not remember anymore because it might not have been a very strong connection um so this is to remind you that you can't just teach a student something once they might remember it for the end of the class or they might remember it up to the test but they'll likely forget it after if you never revisit it so whew. further reading i've gone a little over my planned time but um at the brain sig we have amanda wrote it down clever that's what you should do <laughs> um we have written lots of things down at the brain sig on our website um, which i actually make and maintain um, it is www.mindbrained.org and if you go to our website you can see our think tanks which is a monthly magazine we've been publishing from 2018 to now we haven't missed a month in all of those years and we're still going strong um, they are free to read and download and enjoy it's all there and these two issues in particular on cognitive load and working memory um, relate to what i talked about have more pieces from other writers lots of research that you can you know read further um, so if you're curious about you know want to learn more about what i talked about today which was really just a basic introduction to these concepts um, please take the deeper dive and check out these think tanks